Zivy Owens, and you're listening to the award-winning podcast, Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Please sign up for my newsletter at zibbyowens.com for updates on podcast guests and lots of live events. Hi, everybody. Thanks so much for listening. Um, I hope that you have had a chance to check out We Found Time, wefoundtime.com, my new online magazine. We have such amazing essays out this week, and I really hope you'll take the time to go read them or send them to friends or see what you think. And I'd love your feedback if you have any thoughts. All the essays on We Found Time are written by authors who have been on this podcast already. So it's original content and I think it's really awesome. So I really hope you'll check it out. This week's sponsor is Nini's Treats, which is my in-laws crumb cake business. And it is so good. And they had gone on hiatus for a little while and they're back in business now, stronger than ever. And it's the best crumb cake in all different flavors. And you can order it on goldbelly.com. And their brand is called Nini's Treats. Nini is my husband Kyle's grandmother, N-E-N-E apostrophe S, Nini's Treats. And you just search it on Gold Belly and they have this amazing black and white crumb cake and a regular crumb cake. And anyway, it's really delicious. And for everybody who is at home and going stir crazy, um, it will ship really quickly and fresh and you can freeze it if you don't want to eat it right away. So anyway, ninistreats.com or go buy it on goldbelly.com. I'm here today with Mallory Kasdan, who's the author of Ella, a hilarious, smart children's book published by Viking Children's Books. Ella made Entertainment Weekly's top 10 must list and was featured in Time, Vogue, the LA Times, and the New York Post. Mallory is the host and producer of Milk Podcast, Moms I'd Like to Know. She also hosts the podcast How to Raise a Parent from Slate Studios and Dairy Pure and Coffee and Crayons from Slate Studios and Target. She's a professional voiceover actor for TV and radio. Mallory has contributed to the Washington Post and has produced arts and culture pieces for public radio. Caveller called the Milk Podcast one of the 11 parenting podcasts you need in your life. My podcast is on that list too. Anyway, she currently lives in Brooklyn with her family. Welcome, Mallory. Thanks for coming on Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thank you for having me. It's my pleasure. This is so fun. At first, I only knew you because of your amazing podcast, Milk Mothers, I'd like to know. Thank you. And now you have this children's book that I somehow didn't know about that came out five years ago, which thank God you sent it to me because now my daughter is like obsessed as you saw up the stairs and it's so great. So I want to talk to you about all of it. So thank you. I'm excited. So tell me about Ella, this book. What's it about? What inspired you to write a children's book? So Ella is a parody of Eloise at the Plaza. And I had a six-year-old. This was a few years ago. My daughter was six at the time. And I, we were big fans of Eloise, and I grew up loving it and thinking, what an amazing life to live in New York City and live in a hotel and have that adventure. And then it was my 40th birthday, and I went to a hotel in Williamsburg that had just opened with my husband. We had a party for me. It was really nice. And we (laughs) left the kids at home. So Zoe was six at the time, and Miles was like two. And so we were just so psyched to be like getting out, having a party, being in a hotel. And it was such a sort of... (laughs) It, it was very Brooklyn. You know, it was Brooklyn 2000, I think it was 2012. It was very hip. There was no sign. It was like super groovy. Everything was like reclaimed wood and brick. And it was an old factory that they made into a hotel. It's the wife, in case you're wondering. And I was just picturing Zoe there and seeing her scootering all around the lobby and going, oh my God, this is so, first of all, not really a place for kids. So I was like really glad that she wasn't there, but thinking how funny it would be if she was there sort of mucking up this like, hipster haven. And so I was like, and then I had a little light bulb and I was like, oh, this is totally where Eloise would live. I mean, it's, you know, she wouldn't live in Manhattan anymore because this was the moment of like, Brooklyn is the new Manhattan. It was getting to that sort of fever pitch of Brooklyn as a verb, as a noun. It was, it was Brooklyn as a, as a concept mm-hmm. as opposed to place to live. So I figured, oh yeah. And, and then it just started like going off in my head, all these ideas. You know, I knew she'd have a manny instead of a nanny. I knew she'd have a mom who was, you know, Eloise's mom is quite absent, you know, probably not in the best way, the most healthy way. And I figured Ella's mom would be, you know, a director or an actress director and sort of just be parenting from Europe or parenting from the set, you know. And so it just kind of all came together like that. And I, I went home and I basically wrote it. And I sent it to a friend of mine who has been sort of a guardian angel in my in my career. And I was like, do you think this is funny? Like, do you think this is a good idea. And she was like, this is great. I want you to send it to this woman, a friend of mine who's an agent, and I love it. And I was like, okay, I thought it was a good idea. So (laughs) it it turned out to be a pretty good idea. It was just one of those good ideas, I think. 
It's not just a good idea. It was also executed very well. Thank you. Thank you. I mean, I mean, a lot of people have the ideas and then they don't go home and actually write it. They're like, wouldn't right. this be cool? Like yesterday I had like three different ideas, but I'm not going to do anything with any of them. Do you well, know I mean? right. I mean, I think sometimes, because similarly, I've had a bunch of ideas since. And yeah, I mean, sometimes. Not to say they no, weren't no, no. that good. No, no, I'm just no, saying no. they totally, were ideas, listen, period. <laughs> it's kind of like, how do you, this one happened to be, it was an easy kind of opportunity for me to pay homage to something I really loved as a kid, think about my own daughter as that age, and then also kind of make fun of Brooklyn a lot and just sort of the preciousness of what was happening there at that time and place. Like, oh, come on, everybody. This is like ridiculous. And yet, like, that's my life. Like, I like, that's my parenting life is I live in a community not dissimilar to Williamsburg. I, you know, a lot of those things were very funny because they're true. So... That was like the goal is mocking it in a way that other people could relate to or people couldn't relate to it all because they don't live in New York. And they're like, who the hell lives in a hotel? Who the hell lives in an apartment? Who the hell, like, how do you guys live stacked on top of each other? That kind, you know, I was hoping that people could see it the way that I saw Eloise. Right. You know? Did people really say that? Did you hear that well, feedback? That's such I, a I shame think, if that's true. I mean, well, it was- so no, but what's interesting is that they didn't want to label it Brooklyn. The publisher didn't want to make it New York. They wanted it to be a little bit more vague as a city. It could be a hotel in many cities. It could be, you know, San Francisco. It could be Portland. It could be Seattle. It could be Miami. It could be, you know, Copenhagen. Did I say that wrong? Hagen? Hagen. It could be Barcelona. You know, I think that they were trying to make it less specific. But I knew it was New York, and my illustrator knew it was New York. And so that's why I love it, because it's, you know, it it, it is. It's my New York, and so I, I still, I love it. And how did you team up with your illustrator? So this was so cool. I, you know, I was my, it was my first book. So I didn't have like a ton of, you don't have a ton of like pull, <laughs> you know, I should say. And so when you are a writer and not a writer illustrator, you don't really have a lot of choice in who your illustrator is. Like, unless there's something that you're attached to, like you're famous or you have some other kind of connections to other illustrators. But I kind of had like some kind of thing in my contract that was like, I, I get approval or, or something like that. But I didn't really have any say. But I suggested a bunch of illustrators that I loved, including Myra Kalman, which was like ridiculous because <laughs> that's not happening. But again, dream big. You. Why not? She's, she's the best person that I know who, who is an illustrator. My, I admire her. But then I was on the subway and I saw this, you know, those MTA illustrators and they have those like kind of mur- murals on the train. I saw one and it was this artist, Marcus Chin. And I was like, that's so beautiful. It was a bunch of people like walking in Grand Central and they were kind of like traipsing through Grand Central and they had shopping bags and their, it was a little bit like surrealist. Like they had like, their hats were like also corners of the, of the, you know, cornices on the ceiling. Like it was just this really beautiful portrayal of Grand Central Station and people walking through it and just being so like New York and fabulous. And they were moving and they were fashionable. And I was like, I wrote it down. I was like, that is beautiful. And then they picked him. I mean, it was amazing. It was like, I couldn't have, I couldn't have been happier. That's great. It really was awesome. And he was perfect for the job. And he is a lovely person. And, you know, we got to, we, we really weren't supposed to talk. I think they didn't want you to, they don't want you to interface. They want him to have his own perspective on the character and for him to come up with what the character looks like and feels like and all the other components. But we did talk and and we just like immediately hit it off. And I gave him a couple of like thoughts. And one of which is like, my daughter has a giant rainbow in her room painted on the wall. And so like, I thought like, cause that was just a dream of mine when I was a kid. So I did that for my daughter. And then, so that went into the book. That was the part of the book that both my son and my daughter, the five and six year old were pointing to and being like, why can't, can we have that? I'm like, no, we, you can't have that. You have not doing that. Anyway, they love that. So I was actually going to mention that detail. Yeah. Well, so that was something that made it into the book from my life. And then obviously because I wrote the book, a lot of it reflected behaviors and things at the time that my daughter would say or do. So yeah, so the, a lot of them made it in, which was fun. And, you know, but then he got to re, like he got to reconfigure anything he wanted to do, you know? I mean, he made the protagonist like a little girl of color, which was completely on his creation, which was awesome. And so that was really cool. And that's when it's really interesting to see how an illustrator plays into like bringing a world alive. Like, I was so jealous. I was like, ah, oh, I wish I could draw. Like, I just... I wish I could draw. I mean, it, it made be me... so neat. It's, it's really... It's a skill I would like to have. Same. Yeah. Especially with kids' books, because sometimes, especially with picture books, you need to be able to see a feeling. You can't just write it always. So, anyway, I, I really respect that 
that skill that I saw in Marcus. And he's lovely. So hi, Marcus. <laughs> so let's talk about your podcast in a little bit. Too, sure. And how this all, all fit in with your career. Morphed, right. So why don't we just like go through the brief trajectory? Okay. What happened after? Let's let's do a, a breeze through since college, say. Okay. Okay. So I came to New York because, you know, of course, like I always wanted to live here. And Where are you to, from? I'm from Pittsburgh, PA. So like small city, sort of suburban, but also city. I've heard of Pittsburgh. Yeah, you've heard okay, of it. Yes. It's cool. I mean, <laughs> Pittsburgh is having a, like, actually a comeback now. It was a really lovely place to grow up, but I really wanted to, and then I went to college in Vermont and I was really ready to come to New York after that, even though that was beautiful and I loved it. It was great. It was like, let's, let's get in there. You know, let's get in there. I was interested in media. I was interested in publishing. I was interested in TV. I wanted to work for David Letterman. It was like all I wanted to do. It was the only job I could like envision was being a page or being a, like a, you know, an intern to Letterman, but I didn't get that job. So yeah, I came to New York. I got a job in publishing. I worked for Hyperion. That was my first job. I was a publicity assistant. Then I got, I went to Viking Penguin and I was a publicist. And then I decided I loved books way too much to keep working in publishing, <laughs> truthfully. And I left publishing and sort of at the same time, I was discovering an interest in doing voiceovers, partially because at Penguin, they had me doing publicity for Penguin audiobooks. And this was when audiobooks were all on tapes. And then I'm like dating myself, but they were on tapes and they were on CDs. Mm-hmm. And the authors were very, like people loved authors or, I mean, narrators or hated them. It was like we would get letters from all these people that would say, I can't believe that Stephen King's books are now being read by so-and-so because they used to be, I'm just using that as an example because I can't remember exactly who the actors were that people loved so much, the narrators. But I thought, oh, this is so cool, the idea of narration. And I started doing it a little bit at the New York Public Library has a division for the blind downtown on 20th Street. So I started like honing that a little bit. And then I was looking around to figure out if I could make a jump to start doing voiceovers. So I made a demo tape. I took a class and I, I, I got pretty, I mean, pretty quickly got an agent and started working. I mean, it was weird. It was like a weird niche thing because I think like I had a lot of success pretty quickly and it's not like that all the time. But like for me, it was just, it was the right, I think it was the right focus because it was like so narrow and so kind of weird and random. It wasn't like, I want to be an actor. It was like, I want to be a voice actor. And so It just happened for me. I don't know. I I had the right combination of luck and, I guess, talent. And I was pushy. And I was like, this is what I want to do. So I left publishing, started doing voiceovers as like, you know, you freelance. But you're kind of like being an actor. This was the late 90s. And it was like, I was busy. Like, I was, I had auditions every day. And I was booking. I mean, I was like working. I was running around the city. It was really fun. And I worked for a friend of mine. She became my friend, a PR person. And I was like a freelance publicist for her. She had an office in Soho. It was so fun. Like, that was like the best. Like, late 90s, like, there was money everywhere. The internet was starting. Every company was like paying people to, you know, advertise and hire publicists and internet parties. And it was just a great time, pre-9-11, pre-kids. And I just was having a great old time. So then I... What happened after that? Yeah, I I was doing that. So I signed with an agent in 1998, started working, got my SAG card, and then I was just doing that. I was a voice actor. And so in the meantime, one of the things I loved about publishing was I loved taking authors to public radio. I loved going to, to, at the time it was WNYC. They were down on Center Street. It was like, you'd go to Leonard Lopate. It was awesome. The, The green room was always just like so interesting. So many like Lou Reed would be there. And like, it was just the most awesome people being interviewed for a couple of different public radio shows. And I always just loved that piece of publishing. I loved the author interview part. So that was just like kind of a side thing I always loved. So I started trying to get into radio and making just like pieces. And this was around the time like This American Life was starting and it was all about like the audio documentary and all that kind of stuff. So I was making stuff. I started, I went to a couple conferences and I started making pieces and pitching them to I'm just going on and on. If you want to okay. cut me off ever, just do it. I'm sorry because it's me. I love it. I'm, tot- okay. I'm really interested in okay, this. Okay, good. Okay. So I made a, I went to this Third Coast conference, which is in Chicago, which is like, it was a more of an audio documentary conference. Now it's probably more of a podcast conference, but this was like pre-podcast. This was like 2001, 2002, around that. And I just loved all of the earnestness of like story core and all of these kind of like using the voice and using storytelling as an art to convey a feeling. Just always loved it. So I I made like, I don't know, eight 
to 10 pieces. And I was working, like, steadily pitching them to Studio 360, which is an arts and culture show that's almost, that's ending sh- soon, but it was a big show. And to NPR News, I did a few pieces for them. And they were all, like, I knew interesting artists. And they were like, I was like, this person is really fascinating and I'm going to do a piece about them. And so there was always, like, the arts and culture component of, like, my interest. That was where my interest lied, laid, lie. And... Yes, it was, like, such a great thing. Like, that time was so great. I was, like, doing public radio pieces, earning money from doing voiceover. It was, like, it was great. It was a great moment also. And then I had kids. And not that that wasn't a great thing, but I kept doing the voiceover work pretty consistently right after Zoe was born. And that was awesome because I could get out of the house. Sometimes I could bring her. Sometimes I could leave her with a sitter. I had earning power, but I wasn't, like, dying. I didn't have to, like, deal with a lot of things that people, women, have to deal with when they go back to work after they have kids. So it was a relatively smooth transition because I had the ability to stay in that game. But unfortunately, a lot of the other creative stuff kind of went downhill from there. I couldn't maintain the brain power to continue to pitch ideas or to write, really. I just kind of, like, I had always written sort of blog pieces and that kind of stuff for myself. But the idea of even that was just too much. It was just do the voiceover work and be with my kid and be a mom. Like, that was totally enough for me. And it was great. And so, and then I had my second kid and then that everything kind of went a little bit haywire because that's hard, the second one. And, you know, I think at that time that was when I thought, well, I really need to keep, get back to the creative work. Like, even though I was so exhausted and he was a terrible sleeper and just, it was really tough. I knew that I was feeling that pull back to writing and creating something beyond just doing the ads, which, by the way, were great. I never not, I want, never wanted them to stop, but it was like, you know, it's not like mine. It's I work for other people and I get paid, and that's awesome. But that's when I started to feel like I wanted to get back to doing something. And I think that's when the seed of the, the podcast started to take such a long, winding road to get there. But that's when the podcast kind of started, and it was a lot of women I had met doing voiceovers because there's so many interesting people who are musicians or actors or who are other kinds of artists who— I met who were like all struggling with this concept of like, how do you keep creating and how do you keep, you know, being available and how do you juggle and the same conversations everyone's having in every field. This was just a lot of creative people. So I decided I really wanted to talk to those people. And I came up with this idea of milk because I was reading Goon Squad. How does, what's the title of that book? Jennifer Egan. Egan. A Visit from the Goon Squad. A Visit from the Goon Squad. Okay, Visit from the Goon Squad. Such a great book. And I read it and I saw her speak at the 92nd Street Y. And I was like, oh, that's a mom I'd like to know. Like, I felt like her writing that particular book was so infused with the, like the parental, like it was so, uh, such a mother. She was such a mom voice in that, the, the, the way she treated those characters, it felt like a mother was writing it. And then I just started to notice all of the, you know, and then I read a couple of Danny Shapiro's books and I, I and then Meg Wallitzer, I read The Ten Year Nap and I was like, oh, like there's, you know, this is what's, because I was coming out of those little, little, little kid years and I was like, what is the creative experience of being a mother beyond the baby experience? Like once you get out of that fog, what do you, how do you, what do you do with it? So that was the other seed. And then I was like, I'm just going to, I want to meet these people. I want to talk to Jennifer Egan, I yell at Waldman, you know, Meg Wallitzer. I mean, I haven't, but you know what I mean? But, <laughs> but it's like, that was like how it started. Oh and then gosh, I was like, so there's all these moms I'd like to know. And so eventually I was like, I have to just start. I have to just do it. You know, I'm still doing the voiceover work. So this was a few years ago. This was like 2016, 2000, late 2015. And in between there, my book came out. So like the 2012 period of like fertile mind, when when I started to like get my mind back, that's when I had the idea for the book. And then that process took from like, I don't know, I think I signed the deal in 2013 and it came out in 2015. So I was a little circuitous in my journey there, but that's what I've been doing. So, you know, and in the meantime, I've still, you know, I still do the voiceover work. I have my show. I've done a few other hosted, like I've hosted a few other podcasts now. People now come to me to you know, host their parenting podcasts for different brands. And yeah, and so that's what I do. And my show is really fun because as you know, it's so great to invite people over to your house and get to ask them questions. Like it's an amazing opportunity. Like it's so cool. And so I've been loving doing that. And it's it's really great. But I, you know, it's a lot lot of work. And so I admire you so much because you crank. Like you crank, girl. And it's it's really impressive because I know it's a lot of work. Preparation, actual interviews, reading the books. I mean, I see like a lot of books there that I need to read for next week because I have one coming (laughs) that's coming to my show. The 
Madeline sure. Levine is coming to, I'm interviewing oh, her next me too. week. Oh, good. Next week. Nice. Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> we should just like set up a station. I know. We should. We should. We should. <laughs> so yeah, so I feel like that's kind of my journey. I'm actually thinking now how much more efficient it would be for authors if a bunch of podcasters had a, yep. a space together and they could go from one show to the next. It's true. Well, they do that by phone. They do those like radio I satellites. Noticed, yeah. You don't do anything by phone, do you? You do it. You try to do everything I did a few of those at the beginning. Yeah. Um, it's not as good. It's not as, it's like a waste. And no? also I feel that the, when they're offered like that, hey, would you like to have a 20 minute slot in this marathon right, day? Right, Then you just get very media Pat. trained. Yeah, right. It's not as like your answers. Right. So I don't feel like I'm really learning more than... I would like reading a little more about the author versus like being with them or even on Making Skype or something. Yeah. Yeah, it yeah, just yeah. makes such a difference. Totally or at least true. having more time where you know you're not like in a factory lineup of. Right. So forget it. Forget no, my but, idea. No, but I hear you. Forget my podcast. No, no, no. It's and like plus then I'd empire. have to leave my house and you'd have to leave your house yeah. and I would defeat the whole purpose. No, and they, like, I like when they come to your house. No, I like it too. It's so I know. Great. Forget it. Forget I said it. All right, it forget again. it. Scratch that. <laughs> no, it's a good idea. Sometimes my ideas are just But efficiency is good. I mean, and I think that's so interesting too because when I have authors now, I know because those early days when I was a book publicist and I knew, like, that's all we did. We set up their book tours. Now, granted, it's different now. It's not quite the same, but it's still like you have to get the town cars and you have to get the, you know, the venue for the event. And then you have to make sure people come to the event. I mean, in a lot of ways, it really is sort of the same. They're going through the same thing. And now I think it's tough for authors because there's so much more pressure for them to promote themselves. Mm -hmm. And I mean, I think that's okay. It gives them more agency, but it's also challenging because there's so much out there. It's like so much content all the time. Don't you feel like? Yes. Yes. <laughs> I'm sure authors and like they appreciate so much really having the time and the space to talk about their book. Why did you write this? Like not to have the experience of like the 10 minute, you know, cranking out of the, of the questions. Yeah. I mean, because it's not always about just the book. No. I mean, everybody has such an interesting story. Of course. Don't you think? I oh, mean, that's totally. what I mean. You're, we're both like so interested totally. in other people, right? Totally. It's like, is there anything you have like taken away from any of your interviews that you feel like, oh, this is the one thing like I have to keep in mind or it really helped me or something? I guess what I try to do is like stay within my curiosity realm. Like, I think that's been a challenge is, so the, the first season of the show, I was just really trying to get, it was kind of experimental, like anyone that I thought was interesting, I'd invite on. And so, like, for example, I did an interview with a woman that I became friends with. She was a maternal fetal surgeon. So she did a lot of surgeries on little tiny, 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 tiny babies in utero. And she was just this really, her name's Juliana. She's this incredibly steady, smart, awesome woman. And she had this really demanding job. And her mom was a retired anthropologist, who I think maybe you said yes, that on Yes, yes, yeah, because you have So, a, yeah, and the, she came from, she had had a long career in museum work and in also anthropology and writing all these books about Italy in the 70s. Like, she was just so groovy. And I had her on. I had them both on because she had come to live with her daughter to help watch the kids while she had this big job in Philadelphia that she commuted from New York to do this surgery job. And she had a great husband too, but she needed, she had three boys. And I thought like, well, this is such a cool, interesting group of people, two people that I know, and like, this is working. Like, this is a really great example of how parenting can work in this culture when we don't always have grandparents around or many of us pay for help. Or like, it was a real story of like, I don't know, it was very beautiful because they really they really helped each other out and it was just lovely. And I, so I had them both on. And that was like, not like, maybe I didn't get my most downloads from that story because none of them are like, they're not like, I mean, I had Anna Gasteyer, she's a famous person. Like I've had a few bigger names, but that was like, I just liked them and I thought they were interesting and I thought other people would be interested. And so that's kind of what the show is, is like the example I always give people is like, you go to a party and like, I feel like in this age, when I'm, I'm in my, I'm 47, whenever I go out now, it's like, I always end up yapping with some other cool woman. Like, it's not like I'm ever, I mean, I talk to men, it's not, but it's like, my interest is always in like, well, what are these groovy women doing? You know, all generations. I'm really interested in like, what are older women doing? Like, if you're younger, like, what do you think you're going to be doing? And I think my show, I'm hoping that's the, that's what I'd like to know. That's the main thing I'd like to know is like, well, how's everyone doing out there? You know what I mean? Like, are you doing what you thought you would be doing? Or what do you think you'd want to be doing? Or what surprises have gotten in the way of your life that you're doing exactly what you thought you wouldn't be doing? And I, I think that that's what I want out of it. And Do you feel like you're doing what you want to be doing? I do. I do. But I think, you know, it's funny because most of the time I'm really, pr I'm really proud of my, my creative output. I feel like I'm proud of it and I'm I'm happy, but there are times where I wish I had been, done something more kind of straight, straight ahead. Like my, my, all the ups and downs, it's been very cool, but there are times where you're just like, I wish that I could just 
go to a job and have someone tell me what to do or work with people or have a team or, you know, many of my friends now since I'm 47, like they're, they're very successful. They have big jobs. And, you know, that to me sometimes is like, I don't know what that's like to work in an office. I haven't worked in an office in 20 years. And, and to me, I think things could be a little more, uh, like, not easy, but like more straightforward. But then I think I would not like that. Every opportunity I've had to go in that direction, I've, I've steered way clear of it. So I don't know. I, yeah, I think I'm doing what, I, what I'm supposed to be doing, but it's, all, it's always evolving. And I think it sounds like for you too, it's evolving. It's never going to like, because this is a very interesting field. This podcasting business is very interesting and it's, I don't know, it's, it's not, I'm not sure what it is anymore or what it ever <laughs> has been, but I know that I like talking to people and I like meeting people and I like amplifying good stories and I like the concept of talking into a microphone, and I think I know how to do it pretty well, and I can listen. And so, yeah, so I think I'm doing what I'm supposed to be doing, but we'll see. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know what else I'm doing. I was going to ask you, like, what's coming next? Yeah. But, I mean, I feel like it's all, like, dot, 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 question mark. Well, do, you have, gonna, do you have anything short-term coming up that, aside from the podcast? or? So I, just, I was trying to figure out, so— as I was saying, like, I kind of did this really intense, like, not intense, but just kind of loose first mm-hmm. season. My, my first season was 45 episodes. I mean, that's not, mm-hmm. I don't think they teach you that in podcast school. I mean, I don't really know. I was I just really literally doing it myself. So I was like, when do I stop? When do I cut? I don't me? even have seasons. Right. So, I'm I mean, like, and why, why do you need to? Because you don't. I don't. I don't know. I just don't. I mean, similarly, I feel like yours just grew and grew and grew. And then all of a sudden, like, it was like everyone probably was pitching you and you couldn't not you couldn't say no because you were interested in all these books. That's right? right. That's exactly what's happening. I'm having, I mean, I say no, but. There are a lot of books that are so good. Right. And then I'm like, and then now I'm giving up on this whole person and their whole life. And, I know. But I have to. I have to like say, yes. would I buy this book in a bookstore? And I have to be really strict with myself. Like, right. And I mean, if I wouldn't buy it and it doesn't appeal to me on any level, I'm just, I can't do it. Right. You can't like let your heart be broken by like some book that's like in the library that, or, or like in a bookstore that like no one bought. I mean, it's, it is, it's heartbreaking. It is. I think, that's true. Especially when you meet all these people. And like, so I don't only interview authors. I have but but that is mm-hmm. it tends to be because it, it works a lot very well with the podcast with promotion and mm-hmm. stuff like that. But I think that yeah, I mean everyone has a story. Yeah, it's story. it's hard to not feel compelled to talk to somebody, I and totally I feel agree. like that I like totally people agree. are all interesting, kind of. So I am going to do so the second season of my podcast, which I just finished, was all about loss. I kind of had more of a theme, and I think the next. The season, I'm also going to have a theme because it's anchoring me mm-hmm. in terms of figuring out, like, why. Yeah. Like, it's just making yeah. more sense of, like, well, what's the reason for this? Mm-hmm. Like, I, can, I, I I believe that just talking to people and amplifying things is great. But it's like we're almost at this moment in time where I think I feel like I need some anchor. Like, I need to know what I'm what I'm focusing on. So I'm trying to figure that that part out at the moment. And, yeah, I mean, I have a couple of other book ideas, like, Kind of wanted Ella 2 to happen, didn't happen. I'm working with a producer on a TV project based on Ella. Again, like these things are very hard to do. They're not long, you know, they're long shots, but this is a woman I've been working with for a few years and we have it, we're pitching it, you know, a TV um, animated series. So that might be fun. And yeah, I had an idea for a book that I worked on really hard last year with an agent and we just couldn't do it. It was about loss and talking to kids about loss. And it was really, I really tried. We both tried. And it was like, then we met and we're like, this, we're not going to be able to do it. And I think like, that was also a really good lesson. Like, I don't know, like some things are not necessarily supposed to live on as things other people experience, right? Like it's, it's hard because you want everything that you think. I mean, I want to read that book. I'll I'll send it to you. Send it it to me. I will. It's, so it was the Tree of Life kind of incident. So I grew up in Pittsburgh. That was my synagogue. And when that shooting happened, I wrote a piece for the Washington Post. And it was like really from the heart. It was all about like, you know, where we live in our, like where we live in our childhood minds, like what we, what we bring into our memories about physical spaces. Yeah. Because that story was so evocative because I knew the physical space so intimately. And so I think that that was my idea was that like we, we know intimately where we went to school. We re- remember what the banister feels like yes. walking up the stairs totally. from gym class. Like, And so I wanted to figure out how to convey that in talking to kids about the reality of these terrible things that were happening. And I, I mean, I still don't know how to do that. And so <laughs> like, this is like the question of our ages. Like, how do we talk to our children about all these terrible, difficult things that are happening? And I feel like that's just you know, one one editor was interested from a from a big publisher. 
but like w- we we couldn't it was getting really watered down and i think cuz nobody wants to talk about gun violence and nobody wants to talk about anti-semitism and because right. i mean obviously right yet right it just keeps happening and it seems like there has to be these ways to do it so that's like something i've been thinking about and but it was a really cool experience and I'm glad I worked on it and, you know, I'll sit with it and see what happens. And, you know, and then I have another idea for a book that I was working about, about a little, like, quirky little boy like mine. And that is also kind of happening when I work on it, when I work on it. It's, it's you know, I think it's, these things have to be, if no one's coming to you demanding something, you know, you do what you do, which is now, like, the podcast is rolling. People pitch me. People have books coming out. People are working on cool stuff. I meet them. I'm like, I'd like to talk to you. So, I think at the moment that's the that's the thrust. But, you know, do you have any advice to aspiring authors? I do. I think that if you want to write something, you really have to make it really 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 good. <laughs> I mean, you really do. You really have to work on it for a long time. And I think if you have an idea for something, you got to explore the idea. You you can't particularly a lot of people ask me about writing a kids book. And I think that, you know, you really need to have the book completed and as good as it's going to be. You can't really have an idea and take an idea to an agent at this, and where we are in publishing is too competitive. There's too many people doing it who are already established or who are famous and have like a late night show. And I I, I keep talking about like the late night people because they all do children's books. And to me, it's like, I bet a lot of people have like really funny ideas that aren't the Jimmies or whatever, which is fine. They're great. I love late night guys. Like that's great. But I think that that's the business of publishing. So you got to get your head around that and you have to know that like just because you have an idea for a book and your friend did the illustrations that doesn't mean that you're going to get it into an agent's hands because they're very overwhelmed and I think that you have to just really make it really 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 good or do it yourself because I think in the, I think at this day and age I just don't think that having a book published by a big there's what like three publishers now I don't know that it's going to benefit you that 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 much so if you love it and you have an idea and you want to make it, you should make it. You can make it. You can you can do it. You might have to spend a little money to make it, but then you could decide, do I actually want to like print this a million times? Do I want to try to get it into bookstores and sell it myself? I mean, but do it. Don't be afraid to do stuff. And don't like think that somebody's just going to take your idea and scoop it up and say, yes, let's do it. I mean, I think that that does happen, but it's not that common. Or like if you have an idea for a podcast, like make the podcast, make a few episodes. Like don't just like, talk about it and don't just like ask somebody else how to do it. Like, just do it. You have to just do things. That's, is that harsh? Is that too like mom-like? I love it. I don't know. I love it. It's perfect. It's great. Yeah. It's great advice. Needs to be said. Thank you. Sorry. I don't need to be harsh. I know it's hard. I know it's hard. It's so hard. (laughs) It's so hard. But all the good things you want to do are hard. Anything cool people want to do. It's hard. Yeah. You got to work at it. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. And this was like so So fun. Now you have to come on mine. Okay. Yeah, you'll come over to my house? Sure. Come to Brooklyn? Yeah, we'll just keep going back and forth. Awesome. Okay. Thank you. (laughs) Bye. You've been listening to Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books with Zibby Owens. Please make sure to sign up for my newsletter at zibbyowens.com to get more updates about episodes like these and also lots of live events. Thanks so much for listening today. Again, please go check out wefoundtime.com, wefoundtime.com for this week's new five essays from authors who have been on the podcast. And also go to goldbelly.com and order some Nini's Treats Crumb Cakes. They are so good and you will not regret it, although your clothes might be a little tight next week. Um, I hope you all have a great week. Bye-bye. Thanks. You can follow me on Instagram at Moms Don't Have Time to Read Books. Thanks so much to Steve and Ryan at Texture Sound for the sound editing. And thank you to Morning Moon Productions for providing this fantastic intro and outro music. Thanks for listening. You could always email me at zibby at zibbyowens.com. 